And our title today uh, under our family tree is A Place Called Home. So we'll just jump right into this, do some review for a few moments, and then pick up on those concepts of our family tree, on family and tree and these concepts that are being combined. So as we look at this in verse uh, 33, I'd like for you just to read it again with me and then ponder some of the things that we've covered already. If you, have, if you take notes, you might be able to just flip back and kind of parse over some of those things and we'll highlight some portions, but Abraham planted. We know in planting, this is something that God did. Uh, it is something, it was a tillage of soil, even in some translations. So it's something that Adam was to do. So it's the image of God and the image of Adam. It is a type of Christ uh, who said he would build his church. And it, even in this tree that is built, it is a type of Christ. And even the tree is a type of his church. And so Abraham planted a grove. In some places, it says Abraham planted a tamarisk tree or Abraham planted a tree in Beersheba, and it was there in this grove that he called upon the name of the Lord, and it uses this phrase, it's the first time that it's used in the scripture, the everlasting God. So it speaks to his eternal quality and a God forever to Abraham. And when we read in Genesis chapter 21, we saw where Abraham plants this grove after the promised son came. Doesn't plant it, uh, this instance, and this instance of planting, this tree comes into existence once the promised family comes into expression, a son to Sarah, a son by Abraham. And so this, there was a fulfillment of a vision, but also there was this forward-looking part on Abraham's, in Abraham's actions where he had a vision, where he's planting a family tree for himself, for his wife, and for his son, and then all those that would come after him. Any of the ones that would come after Isaac, there would be this place uh, that, uh, uh, that they could worship, a place where his family would honor God, worship the Bible says the everlasting God. And we identified how in planting a tree it wasn't selfish, not immediately to satisfy the flesh uh, or self-serving. Unless Abraham, unless there was nurseries in those days that had the equipment that we do today where you could buy a $55,000 tree and have it transplanted and have a nice mature tree in your front yard. Wouldn't that be nice if that was within reach, right? Uh, we, Elliot and I have had an ongoing debate as to whether or not there's any trees in Phoenix. I don't know if it is uh, one of those conspiracy theories like there, there are no birds or birds aren't real, but uh, sometimes you wish for a tree. Well, Abraham planted a tree and knew that it would take a long time for this to grow. If it was a fruit tree, though many don't believe it was, it would take years for it to fruit. So it was something that was forward-looking, something that had a vision. And I was really moved by how the Hebrews treat this scripture. In the Hebrew, it's a, Abraham planted an ashel. And to a Hebrew, it was a place of hospitality. And this is what they teach in their, their synagogues. And this is what the, the rabbis teach. This is what their theologians hold in their tradition, orally and in written, that it was a place of feeding and drinking and supplying, where you would give uh, things to the travelers and to guests and to family that would come. And they even look at the name Michelle, and it's actually an acronym for feeding, drinking, and accompanying, and giving uh, possessions and giving uh, service to people. And they don't just say that it was a place where he's standing under a tree like this saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And that's how he called upon the name of the Lord. But rather, he invoked the name of the everlasting God by the acts that he performed under the tree. And in this grove and this garden that he built, this place of worship, that he would invite travelers that were passing through and say, you look weary, you look tired, come and sojourn here for a little bit and, and dwell with me for the night or come in for the day. And he would, uh, he would minister to them. And when he would done it, have done it, they would have wanted to thank him. And they would have said, oh, you're a wonderful man and, and, and praise be to you. And he'd say, no, uh, these things have not come by my hand, but they've come by the everlasting God. And, and he would be able to witness and to testify of the things that God had done for him. I imagine, I mean, Abraham had a testimony. He had a testimony unfolding. There was things, there were stories he could tell. I was, I was, I dwelled in Babylon and I, I left with my family and I traveled here and I traveled there. And then to begin to tell a story about, and God spoke to me, he appeared to me in a vision and God told me to do this and God told me to do that. And they may all be thinking, yeah, we've heard of deities, we've heard of gods, but this is something that was real, uh, that he could begin to go through his life and tell these testimonies. And so it was a place where he could testify. It was a place where he could serve. And, and so the Jews hold it as it was a shell, was a place where God was manifested by how he served others. It was a place where he could point others to God. And we looked at the different places in Scripture where Abraham and even his seed after him returned back to this very place to offer sacrifice, 
um, to worship, to serve God. And it was a place not only where they worshiped, but they found rest. It's a place where they were fed as Elijah fled to the, uh, Beersheba, left his servant there and went into the wilderness of Beersheba. And he was fed by God. He was strengthened. And then God spoke to his children there, gave them visions, appeared to them, ministered to Elijah there. And so this is a special place. And we're using Abraham's grove as a type of our family tree. Uh, that family tree is the one that's kind of maybe lined up next to you in the chairs you're sitting in today. And it's also a type of this family tree, which we're a part of as a church. Amen. And so we want you to see different layers of application in your life. Now, two concepts merge together. I mentioned this uh, just a moment ago, how two concepts merge together in the thought of our family tree. And so this phrase family tree, there's two different concepts that we could amplify. One is a relationship and the other one is fellowship. And so in that there's connection and there's communion. And so there's relationship, connection, there's fellowship and communion. Those are two different things. Family embodies the relationship and the connection. And then the tree is a place of fellowship or communion. Now, this is a subject that I would like to expand. I thought I would maybe expand it a little bit more today, but I just want to introduce it. A family is a group consisting, a group of people consisting of parents and children would kind of be the modern definition a group of people, a group of parents and children living together in a household. There's different legal rules for a household and, and dependents or living under the same roof or depending on one another. But that's what we would, how we would define a family today. I've been reading a number of articles and scholarship on what family is and how to define family. And it's very interesting anymore uh, how they want, like to define a family. But it would be parents and children living together in a house. And maybe another definition, a group of individuals living under one roof and under one head. And this is, uh, this is how we refer to a family. And then there's also a definition of a group of people united by certain convictions and or a common affiliation. And so that's another way of looking at a family. And I believe that the, the, the believers, they, they have a connection which is real in the same sense you'd have parents and children together in one household uh, they also fit the definition of those who have a common conviction and they have a, a certain affiliation that connects them together. But it's important to recognize that the true body of Christ really transcends anything natural. And we're only using natural things to somehow get our minds around what the body of Christ is. But the body of Christ is a family. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 15, referring to Jesus Christ in verse 14, of, ho of whom... The whole family in heaven and in earth is named. And so the body of Christ is referred to as a family. In the, in the New Testament, the word family is patria. It's also uh, translated the lineage or kindred. But this is the way that it describes family. And this is perfect, I think, for, for us believers. It's lineage running back to the same progenitor. The same father, the same source, the same ancestry. And it's all those who in a given people lay claim to a common origin. So it also maybe would refer to a race or a tribe. So if you're, you're in a family, if you have a common origin, you're in a family, if you have a common father, you have a common, common ancestry and a common progenitor. So in the natural, this is so, uh, that's why Israel is such a beautiful type because they are a people that their religion and their conviction, their belief was associated with who they were in their flesh. Like their, their actual DNA determined that they were Israelites, they were Jews, and they had a religion, they had a God of their father. And so the way that they would relate to one another in the natural is a type of how we are spiritually related to Christ in a very real way, a very real way. It says in Luke chapter 2, verse 4, this kind of captures that thought. It's talking about Joseph. I don't know if I provided this one. It says, and Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. And it says, because he was of the house and lineage of David. So he was of the family of David. He had descended from David. So that's why he went to Bethlehem because he was of the house of David or the lineage of David. He was in David's family. Now we know that this in Israel would relate to grandparents, great, great grandparents. And they would say, we are of our father Abraham because they descended from Lineally from him. They are the lineage of Abraham. But I believe it was Brother Manuel, and, and I trust that we had that prayer request in to pray for him. He's ministering in Tucson today. Uh, really enjoyed Wednesday night service. He mentioned Wednesday night that God doesn't have grandchildren. 
Uh, and he described a unique way that he had a relationship with God through his mom. And so it's, uh, it's God does not have that kind of relationship. So we are all uh, descended from God. We are his children. And, and as it says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, the household of faith, do good, especially to them who are of the household, of the lineage, of the, pro, of the progeny of God, the household of faith. And a household means it belongs to a family. And when you speak of a household, there's intimate relationships. There's blood connections. Uh, it's called kindred. And so when we say family, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at relationship. When we, when we talk about family, we're talking about connection, that we would look at one another and we do not have connection because we have the same membership in Arizona Believers Church. But we have connection because we are part of the family of God. Amen. And we have a connection to one another because we have the same father. And Christ is our head. And so that's what the true church is. That's who you are a part of. Then we, we have that becomes our model, our example, and how we'd like to participate and interact with one another in this household. Because all being children of God, we've gathered here, so then we ought to conduct ourselves in the house of God, how that we would conduct ourselves in the family of God. Because God's family is a picture of what our family ought to be as heads of our own homes, and then also what our church ought to be. And I believe that in our, in our families at home and wherever you may be and whatever your arrangement might be as far as family, we should strive to reflect God's order of the family. However, God has arranged it and how he's placed it. It's remarkable, and I might find myself veering out a little bit here. It's remarkable how much of our duty as Christians is expressed in the terms of our relationships to other people. Right. And taking your place as a man, taking your place as a woman, taking your place as children, and all the different things that we would do. In some way, it relates to our position and relationship to other people. And so we should strive to find that our place in our lives but then also to reflect Christ and God's order in these different relationships. So that's the concept of family. When I talk about family, these are some of the things we're talking about. This household of faith, the family of God. Now, I want to touch on very quickly the concept of fellowship. Because when we say our family, we're a family, but then there's a tree. And that could be in the sense that we all descend from Christ or we're all, re we're all related to God. So you can see that as a, a lineage. I don't know how that runs like this. Uh, for a very, very long time, and there's no grandchildren, so it's just those two levels, God and then everybody else. Uh, and it, it kind of the sparks the interesting theological discussions about what the wedding supper table is going to look like and the seating arrangement. Um, that's always fun and fruitless, uh, <laughs> but it is, it is fun just to ponder it and think about it. And not saying it is, but could it be a table so long or so high or a spiral so that we all see a big round table, right? So we're all facing each other. You got perfect eyesight, right? So it's going to be like they're right there. See, it could be fun. So uh, this idea, um, so that's our, we have our family Then we, as a tree. We're looking at this concept of fellowship when we talk about a tree. And this is, uh, I, I believe fellowship and communion is embodied in the idea. At least this is how I'm reading it in the scripture. This is how it strikes me the different places that I read about uh, um, the, the symbolism and the type of a tree. But the idea and image of a tree is expressing the idea of connection and fellowship. A grove would be a place that you would come to. A garden uh, would be a place that you would spend time in. I still remember very, very vividly, Sister Elizabeth can attest to this, it's almost as if we could walk through each pace that when we were received into Brother Harold and Sister Ernestine Beckett's home in Cape Town, uh, that they greeted us and they, and they showed love to us. And then uh, Sister Ernestine took Elizabeth into one room and Brother Beckett took me in another and they washed our feet. It was, it was remarkable. I still to this day can just be moved with emotion and pondered. And then having washed our feet and prayed for us, they, 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 they got us maybe something to drink. And then he walked us out into a garden. It was a grove. And we sat underneath the uh, greenery and everything and, and a beautiful place. And I, did he have some music playing? I think there might, I don't know if there was music. Maybe I was just hearing it. Maybe my wife was singing to me. <laughs> but then he just sat us down. He says, why don't you two just spend some time together and rest a little bit? in this grove or this garden and he went away and he just left us there to fellowship and commune with one another and then he came back a little bit later just began to speak to us then he began to prophesy to us tell us what to expect things that were going to happen sure enough it happened exactly like he said it would but it was a wonderful time and it happened there under these trees in this arbor in this grove because that's what is expressed about a garden 
And trees hold a rich symbolism in the Bible, hold symbolism in literature, even in humanity. There's a lot of ways that trees are expressed in other religions. And again, this is not just uh, me doing a search on trees and repeating tree, trees, 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 trees all over again. And then telling you that it's 777 inches to that tree out there and getting us all excited. But rather, it's just to, to really look deep into uh, what God is meaning in a particular scripture. Because Abraham's tree, the Tamar's tree, Abraham's grove represented a gathering place for fellowship. If you say, no, Brother Aaron, that's not what it meant. That's not what it was. It was just an altar. It was just a single tree. I'm not going to argue with you. We're using it as a type. A type of communion and hospitality. It was a place where relationships could be formed. Maybe someone entered in as a stranger, but then they, they left a brother. They left a friend. It was a place where connections could be formed. Uh, relationships could be formed. It was a place where you could cultivate common conviction uh, and ambition and aspiration. That you come together and you have a common goal. You have common ideals. And you could gather under that tree and you could inspire one another. And you could encourage one another. And that's what uh, our tree ought to be as Christians. We have a common ambition, which is Christ. And we're out there on our own, on our own, as our own families and out there doing things on our own. But then when we gather back here on the Sunday mornings and Wednesday night, we have to realize that this is a wonderful opportunity to communicate to one another and to cultivate common uh, ambition and, 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 and what we're trying to do and encourage one another. Amen. I was fellowshipping with Brother Samuel and Brother Ellie. And it was just heartbreaking to think of some of the situations that are taking place in families and in churches and how that there seems so often, and this wasn't their expression, it was mine, how so often families seem to be completely on their own in church, but completely on their own trying to raise their children. And they say, well, it's the family that's got the duty and the responsibility to do it. And it's their fault if the children backslide, and it's their fault if they don't hold the standard in the home. And I believe that we could all say amen, but it's the church's responsibility to support them in that endeavor. And if the parents aren't getting support, if they're not being taught wisdom, if they're not being shown things and encouraged in things, and sometimes even being told, hey, you know what? That's just normal. It's just a phase. Every parent has children that do that. There's no reason to be embarrassed or just that kind of encouragement and support. I'll be praying for you, looking out after you. That, that's, what, that's what we ought to be doing for one another. Our, our testimony as a family, uh, Sister Elizabeth and I and our children, is that there have been people in our lives that have uh, made a difference. People in the body of Christ that have made a difference in our life uh, and, and made a, that impacted us. And then we're being given an opportunity now to impact the children of those very people that made an impact in our lives. And then we see they, those children that we impacted having an impact on our children. And that's the way the family ought to work. That's the way the church ought to work. And it's those fellowship, that communion. And it says in verse 34, I just want to compliment everyone on creating such a wonderful atmosphere. Brother Michael, tremendous job. The musicians, it's just such a, a, a pleasing atmosphere here today to minister the word. And, and I don't know that this would necessarily be a warning. Maybe this would just be like, uh, 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 just get everyone really, really excited. Uh, but since we're not having Wednesday night service, I'm kind of combining I'm combining services today. And so I'm not really combining services, but I really want to get all most that we can out of this. But verse 34, and Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' land many days. Sojourned, it's a word actually that I think I never really looked up and, and researched it, but it was just kind of a word that to me meant something. And I kind of, sojourned to me kind of meant traveling. But it actually is kind of the, the opposite. To sojourn is to take your abode. And, and he dwelled and inhabited. And so there was a, there's a, it means to continue. And actually the word comes from, it holds the root meaning and it means to seek hospitality with. And so when the Bible says when he planted a grove and then you realize, well, maybe the Jews weren't off on a limb when they said it was hospitality. They're using a very word of hospitality. He built a grove and then sought hospitality with the Philistines many days. In other words, it was by the means of this grove, he invoked the name of God. It was a place of hospitality. And when he abode there, he dwelt, he inhabited it. He continued there and he sought hospitality in this place of the Philistines in the land of promise. But it was the Philistines' land, the land of the Philistines, many days. So he was not just there temporarily. He did not get a hotel, hotel room and stream service that night, but he 
put up his tent. He built a, a grove. He had a place of worship and he remained there many days. Now in Hebrews chapter 11 verses 8 to 10, I want to use these several verses in Hebrews chapter 11 just to kind of look on the, this other side of Abraham's vision and desire. By faith, Abraham when he was called to go out into a, a place which he should after receive for an inheritance. Inheritance in the Greek is property received. It's something that's given as a possession. So when you receive something by inheritance, you typically receive it from a family member. Family uh, home or family land is passed down. And so he was called to go to a place which he would receive for an inheritance. It's a family inheritance. It's a place that he would receive as an inheritance, uh, inheritance, as a gift from one uh, in his family. So this is what he's seeking is an inherited home, an inherited land. Obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise. He remained, he abided, he sought hospitality in the land of promise. As in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob... The heirs with him of the same promise. So now notice he is, by faith, he dwelled in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. By faith, he lived in tents with his family. Soldiering. And these are kindreds who are heirs of this eternal home. This, as it says, that uh, heirs of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What was it? The future home. The eternal home. Remember in the series, and I know you remember exactly the date, the title and everything I said on, in the supreme faith of Abraham and how that he was looking for the thing that God was revealing to him is, I will be a God to thee forever. Right. I'm going to give you an inheritance forever. I am the everlasting God. And at some point, Abraham could have had this kind of faith to say, wait a minute, you mean forever? Right. It's like, so then that means what happens to death? And God would have been like, you're, you're on to something. I don't know how his conversations went, but I've had a lot of people tell me stories how they have conversations with God, and I can't find that anywhere in the Bible where God talks to people the way they say he does. And so this is an eternal home that he was seeking for. But yet, even though he had an eternal home, it says by faith he dwelled in tabernacles. It's still by faith that he continued uh, remained and abided. It's still by faith that he's, he's, by faith he has a vision of home. By faith he sees something eternal. But then he has faith to build him a place. He has a place, a, a faith that causes him to settle. And it says in verse 13 about these forefathers, these all died in faith, not, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed. Notice this phrase, that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Just an immigrant. I'm just one that's passing through. I have no permanent possession in this land. I'm a stranger and a pilgrim. I've come from, I've left my homeland. I've left where my roots are. I left where I thought I would be forever. And I'm in this place that's strange. I have no family connections. I have no legacy here. I I only have a promised future. I have nothing to show as far as a a title deed or anything. But here I am on a promise. It says, but I'm a stranger and a pilgrim on earth. Remember that phrase. I want to carry it through. And so Abraham's vision of a future home, it was permanent, fixed, a city that hath foundations. This image, this is what I want you to catch. By faith, he sought an inherited place, but then by faith, he he built dwelling places when he sojourned. So it gave him, this vision of a future home gave him an image for his earthly dwelling. What, What he saw his future home to be, it gave him a goal and a vision and ambition to pattern himself after that. I don't want to just live here loose and indifferent and, and, and live uh, sad and beaten down and unhealthy and, and kind of take that as my lot in life and then be like, but one day I'm going to be happy, I'm going to be sin-free, I'm, and I'm going to be healthy, and then just kind of undergo here until you get there, but rather use the vision of the future home and say, then that I can pattern what that life will be there. I want this life to begin to express and manifest those things. It's even what this baptism of the Holy Ghost is a down payment of and the guarantee of is the blessedness of eternity and perfection. And so Abraham had that vision of the future home and he could pattern his present home after it and perhaps inspired by it, inspired by that vision of eternity, he built a grove to serve 
the purpose of the eternal everlasting one. I want you to catch this. Though a stranger and a pilgrim on earth, he built a home. Even though he was scattered, even though he was, uh, even though he was seemingly didn't, couldn't say whether or not he would be here permanently and he didn't lay a foundation and he was always renting and always in a place of tents that could be wrapped up and taken away and, and move on, he still, where he was, he built a home. Even though he was scattered, he could sojourn. I remember Father Abraham provides an example and so we see this pattern happen when the church begins, the, the body of Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So he's writing this letter to the strangers. Remember how that the Bible Paul called Abraham and his seed after him. Strangers and pilgrims. Now, Peter is referring to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The word strangers scattered throughout in one translation is sojourners of the dispersion. That might be a good band name. Uh, sojourners of the dispersion. And the sojourners of the dispersion, the dispor, the scattering about, looking for a heavenly Jerusalem. Pilgrims and strangers looking for heavenly Jerusalem as their home, just as Abraham had a vision and he went out and he abode and he dwelt and he worshiped God. Now the Christian church is being scattered abroad and they don't go out to Galatia or Pontus or Cappadocia or Bithynia and Asia being a portion of that Asia Minor, the present day Turkey on the furthermost west part. There wasn't, it wasn't that they, oh, well, this is where we're forever going to be and this is my lot in life and this is my permanent abode and this is my fixed dwelling uh, they went where God sent them they went where God was placing them uh, and in doing it they realized that one day they have an inheritance in the eternal Amen. have any of you ever debated um, just uh, after you got done talking about the the table at the wedding supper I uh, debated about wh what you're going to get in the millennium you ever talked about that and I, Sister Elizabeth and I just believe that because we've come to Phoenix and spend out our days here, that God's going to give us Leelanau Peninsula in Michigan in the millennium. <laughs> and I don't know if it works that way, but it's fun to talk about it. I think maybe just fruitless, but I, there's an idea that I, I'm not looking at whatever takes place here in the 75 to 100 something years that we have on earth that this is going to be the sum and substance, and I take my character and I leave a legacy, and there's not going to be anything to show for it. There's an eternal home that we're going to. Yes, and so do we have that first map? I don't know if that's next, and then maybe track the notes in there um, so we can see this. I don't know if you'll be able to see it very well, and I kind of apologize for incongruent maps that I'm using. I like to use things that would be... Um, look a little bit better, but I found I was spending maybe too much time trying to find a map that I found some that could kind of help. I want you to listen to what I'm saying, but if you want your eyes to kind of glance at this map and look at this to see the different places that Paul mentions in the north there, Pontus and Bithynia, Galatia in the middle, uh, Asia to, uh, uh, to the west, Cappadocia to the east, and, and, and Peter, excuse me, is describing strangers scattered throughout this area, sojourners of the dispersion. And it scattered, it means it's driven out of their own land and, and, and moved, or driven, uh, driven out by persecution and being driven out by persecution and circumstance. They, they were seeking a place of refuge and a place of safety. And there's a reason why they went. And it says in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul was consenting unto his death and kind of jumping into the, uh, the, the middle of this. And it says, and at that time, this is the part I want you to see, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so there is a persecution of the church at Jerusalem. And then what happens is all the believers that had gathered at Jerusalem, they begin to be persecuted. And so they start to scatter a little bit. This is what the Bible is showing us, the scattering. Because we see the example of Abraham traveling down. You can actually uh, track it on this map. You can see where Abraham began and would have come down and entered into the promised land, even going down into Egypt and coming back up. It's showing that now in the birth of the Christian church, starting there at Jerusalem, all these believers, because of persecution, 
are scattered through these other regions, but the apostles stay. So believers are being scattered. Now in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, and you can again just continue to ponder this map. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Now you can go to these verses here, Brother John, and we'll come back to these maps. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. So again, he's beseeching them as pilgrims and strangers, dispersed among the world, scattered abroad. This is how Paul refers to the believer in that day, in that time. Strangers and pilgrims, dispersed abroad, scattered about because of persecution. Paul, acting against the church, scatters them abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And now I want you to catch that we're still pilgrims and strangers. And there's many, many, many scriptures and quotes we can use on this. And the sermon, once more, Lord. Brother Branham says, Lord God, may our eyes come open to the fact that he is still the Messiah. And may we embrace him tonight, for we have confessed that we are pilgrims and strangers of this world. It says it many, many different times. So though Peter was referring to people who were literally of a diaspora within the Christian church. And literally Christians scattered abroad, as it says, from Judea and Samaria and all, all the areas round about. And Peter even saying they're in Cappadocia and they're in Asia and Bithynia and Galatia. He says, you being strangers and pilgrims. And that's true then and it's true today that we are pilgrims and strangers of this world. He says, this is not our home. This is not our land. We are a different acting people because we are born from above. Amen. Born again from above. And I, this is... I, I want to continue reading this because it holds such a critical part to what we're saying this morning. And we who hold this promise in our heart, may we see the promise that Jesus made to his church that we would see just prior to his coming as we see the days of Noah returning, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage and the morals of the land. Then he said, as it was in the days of Sodom to the Gentiles before the fire fell, that God came down and was manifested in flesh by knowing the secrets of the hearts of the people. And he promised the same thing to return. Kind of brings Abraham into this image of pilgrims and strangers and God's visitation. And so we are pilgrims and strangers like the first church was. And we are like Abraham. We're dwelling even in uh, temporal bodies, temporary bodies. We are dwelling in temporary houses. We, we do it looking for an eternal body. We do it looking for an eternal mansion, a place to live, an eternal inheritance. And it ought to be a comfort to us that when we see the signs of economic downturn, when we see the reality of losing things that we hold dear, or our 401k is kind of just going to nosedive, and everything we save up for is dwindling away, and our, all the, those um, altcoins that we thought we'd be able to retire on uh, this August are worth nothing. There should be some consolation uh, that you can always repent and not make the same mistake again. And that we have an eternal inheritance. Amen. It ought to be a consolation to us. Isn't not Paul that told us that if we were only living this life, Christians are the most miserable people? And it's amazing how some Christians just live the most miserable lives. And it's a shame when we want everyone else to be miserable. I think sometimes, I don't, this is just really impressed upon my heart over the last couple of days, how sometimes we see people that, 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 whether it be family members, they fellowship with us, they live with us. They went to church with us. They confessed the same things we did, and they backslide, and they go off. And, and, and it looks like they're living their best life. I mean, like they are what hipsters aspire to be. And we, we want to say, we want to say, oh, you're miserable. You're not happy. You must be totally miserable. What if they're totally happy? What, what, if, they, what if they are finally free and living their best life? Because remember, this is by election. And if someone who doesn't have the seed of God uh, with, the, with the, the, the perversions that exist and the manipulations and the tortures that people use the Bible to inflict upon other people, they are miserable because they've never experienced the grace of God. They only experience the legalism of man and man legally is trying to make them seed when they're not. That produces people who are crazy, who are depressed, who are manic. Who, who can't find peace except they experience the love of God from those who actually have it. 
And they get away from toxic cultures and toxic environments. Like, no, I really am happy. You know what I find in my heart thinking? I'm glad they are. I want them to be free from uh, uh, depression. I want them to be free from affliction. I want them to be free from sorrow. I want them to be free from, from anxiety. And if they can have that, God bless them. And if they're elect, they're coming right back to what they left. And the only way they're going to want to come to it is if we're salty enough and Christ-like enough and have a door open enough that's a place where they could come to find Him. And so we are like Abraham looking for something eternal. And as Abraham planted a grove in the wilderness of Beersheba in the land of the Philistines, God will provide for us a place. This is where I get my thought and the title came from. God will. Because I, 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 I there's ways you look at it. Well, the tree represents Christ. The tree represents the church. Well, Abraham represents Adam. Or he represents God. And you're thinking, man, you could just type anything any way you want. Well, yeah, you're free to do whatever you want, I guess. But I, I, I see the truth and I catch the principle in God's word. And then the types can be used and emerged. Because at the end of the day, you say, well, maybe that's not a good type. The truth remains. The truth remains. And what I began to real, what I, the way I looked at it is I couldn't put myself, I could put myself in the place of Abraham, but then I put myself in the place of Abraham's seed and what Abraham did for Isaac and what he was doing for Jacob and what he was doing for his seed. And I saw Abraham acting as God, implanting a grove for a place for his son to worship, planting a grove for all the other those who would come to know him, a place that they could gather to have common fellowship. So just as we are strangers and pilgrims, and Abraham, a stranger and pilgrim, planted a place in the land of the Philistines, he's promised to provide for you a place that you can call home. Now we can look at these maps again. Consider the elect scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God's sheep were scattered for different reasons. Spread out all over Asia Minor and even further abroad. And it's uh, some of the references you find in Scripture and some of the, uh, the convictions and beliefs based upon that, the furthest reaches that maybe some of the apostles went. It's, it's a marvel. It's a marvel to something to marvel at when you consider just how far the gospel was spreading then. And to look at this, and we know that the, the day, when the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, well, I want to come to that, and the church began to grow from there. Paul accounts of this in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 3. We believe Luke writing. And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. Again, I just want you to ponder the map as you listen to these places. And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. So here's a man who was born in Pontus, which would be at the north of Asia Minor. But then he immigrated and moved to Italy. But then the Bible says, because he says lately he had come from Italy. But then it says, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. So here's someone born in one place, moves to another place, and now he has departed. He finds himself in, a, in, in another region. And it, Paul just happens to come to him. And Paul comes to them come in Corinth and came to them, and because he was of the same craft, Paul being a tent maker, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And I guess it blessed me to see this in that Abraham would have constructed a tent and raised a tent as pilgrims and strangers, and here's Paul making tents, making dwelling places, making tabernacles together with Aquila. Began in Pontus, moved to Rome, now moved to Corinth. God moves his people for different reasons. But when they were in Corinth, Paul had a place to come and abide. God had provided a place even for Paul. And then later in the same chapter, speaking of Apollos, who was born in Alexandria and then came to Ephesus, it says, and they be he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them. And so they take him into their home and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. This is the one born in Pontus, living in Italy, now migrating back. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19, I'm just going through some of these verses we've used before, but kind of look at this 
where everyone spread and, and recognized this common thing. Scattered throughout, but notice what's happening. Paul says, the churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So it's churches of Asia. When we say Asia, again, you notice it's on, it would be, uh, it wouldn't be all of Asia that we refer to today as a continent, but this, this one part on the western coast. Colossians chapter 4, verse 15, salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and, and Nymphos and the church which is in his house. In Galatians, it speaks about the churches of Galatia. And Paul writes to Philemon in verse 2, the church in thy house together with his brothers. In Acts chapter 14, verse 23, and when they had ordained them elders in every church. So there's churches of Asia, there's churches throughout these different areas, and they had to ordain pastors in every church. Paul wasn't going around setting up live streams. Acts chapter 15, verse 41, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. So again, now this is in Syria and, and Cilicia. In Acts chapter 16, verse 5, and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, so if you can find it on the map, it says, Moreover, brethren, we do, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. If God called a man to Macedonia, don't you think they're just, wouldn't he just call him to the whole church, of Ma a whole place of Macedonia? It should only be one church in Macedonia, but there was churches of Macedonia. Yeah. Revelation chapter 1 verse 11 saying, I am Alpha and Omega, hear Christ speaking, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto thee, seven churches which are in Asia. There were seven literal churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Wasn't just one mega church, wasn't just one pastor, but they all served the true church. Yeah. And as you look at this and ponder this, why would God establish churches in these places? Why would we read through and find that there was churches in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, uh, in Corinth, uh, and in Ephesus, and in Laodicea? And Syria, and Cilicia, and Macedonia, and Thyatira, and Sardis, Philadelphia, Pergamos, Smyrna. All these places. Why would there be churches in all these different places? There's ways that we could track the, um, Paul's travels and find. There's a lot of other places you could see where churches were being established. Why would all these places have a church and then God ordain an elder in that church? Because it's where God would place his elect. That's where the elect went. So God was establishing a place for the elect. To where they would not be on their own. They would not be alone, but there would be a place, a grove where they could worship. You see where all this began in Acts chapter 2, verses 4 to 12. This is very beautiful. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. This is the day of Pentecost. They were 112, 120 gathered in the upper room and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when his, this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So they were born elsewhere, but now we're in Jerusalem. And some say they living there. Uh, they dwelled there. Some others saying they're visiting at, at the time of the Passover. And I could certainly say it would be true that they may be devout men, Jews living, as the Bible says, proselytes to the faith or Jews themselves who had lived there and migrated there. And then others who may have come for the Passover. But now in this one place, they're hearing the word of God preached. They're hearing this remarkable move of God. And it says we hear every man in our own wherein we were born Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus in Asia, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Think of all these places. And they were all amazed and were doubt saying one another, what meaneth this? So they all came to one place and began to see God fulfill his word, hear a gospel, hear Jesus Christ preached. And then what happens from here? If you look at this, 
This is what we just read. From this one place, they hear the word of God. And then it says the, 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 the believers were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea. And whether they had come for the Passover and heard the truth and then left, or they were dwelling there when they were persecuted, they all went back to the places they lived before. And all of a sudden, from one epicenter, you can see where it starts in Jerusalem. And they go back to Egypt and Libya and Crete and Rome. And they spread out each one of these believers branching off. And this is how the faith was propagated. Like seeds from a tree. And the winds of persecution and winds of change and winds of leadership. And God calling people either back home or to other places to seek safety. This is how the faith was established and spread and dispersed. The, the, the elect heard the word where they were. But when they were placed by God and sent out, the word went with them. And when they found themselves in Galatia in Pontus and all these other places, God there would plant a grove where the elect could gather around the word. God dispersed the elect, but he always provided a home. A place that could speak about and lift up and reflect their future home. Now in Jeremiah chapter 23 verses 1 to 6, I'm going to read through this. And I want you just to catch the image of God's promise to you. Jeremiah chapter 23 verses 1 to 6. And again, there's much that we could expound on this. But in this image of scattering, as Peter said, they're scattered abroad. Luke writing, scattered abroad. Everyone's scattered. But where they ended up, God provided a place. He says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them. And I will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. What a beautiful call back to the Garden of Eden. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more. Nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. What beautiful language. What a beautiful promise to us. And how, how often some of us have looked to this scripture as God's promise to me as a believer. That he promised he would feed me. He promised he would care for me. He promised he would give me substance. That he would feed the word to me. This is a promise that he gave me. And then it, it, it blends into a prophecy of Christ. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David, who was a shepherd, a righteous branch. Remember this image of a family tree coming out of David. Christ is that branch. Christ is that tree. And a king shall reign and prosper. David was a shepherd who became a king. Christ is the image of this tree as a shepherd, as a king, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. And in his days Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. The tree, the tree of righteousness. Christ is the branch. Christ is the shepherd. Christ is the king. And this prophecy is connected to what God is going to do when he takes scattered sheep and brings them to their fold where they'll be fruitful and increase and be fed and fear no more nor be dismayed nor be lacking. It's going to be where he raises up a shepherd and provides a branch and provides a place of shelter and safety. I will gather my flock, in our spiritual sense, the elect, and bring them to their folds. They will have a home. Flock here is a reference to pastoral sheep. And, and all animals within a breed are related, strictly speaking. And according to the law in Leviticus 19.19, 19, Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with diverse kind. The image is not just some hodgepodge of, a, 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 of different species mixed together and a whole, you know, different things. Uh, 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 and you got a cow, you got an ox, you've got a, a goat, you've got a giraffe, you've got a rhino, just all kind of gathering along. No, it would have been a, this homogenous herd of sheep. 
And, it, and, and in the purity, they would gender them together of their kind. They would be the same seed, the same family. That's what's seen in this flock that are scattered about, these sheep that are driven out. And I'm going to bring them back to, it's his flock. So they're of his seed. His, and I'm going to bring them to their folds. It's a place of abode, a habitation. Notice the language of the scripture. It says it's going to be a safe place to dwell. A place of rest and provision under his branches, under his care. A place to be cared for. Just read what it says here in the scripture. It's a place to be cared for. A place to be fruitful. A place to increase. A place to be washed of fear. I'm going to bring them back and in their fold, they're going to be washed of fear. And it says, neither shall they be dismayed. This is a very beautiful uh, uh, promise because it says it's going to be a place of healing. They're healed of their dismay, which is a brokenness. Neither shall they be lacking. Under this righteous branch, under this righteous tree, there'll be a place of safety, security, justice, judgment. It's a place reflecting home. Where the king is. And let me say this. I'm, I'm making a turn and I feel that I'm, I'm rounding second on my way to home in an inside the park home run. That this is what our houses ought to be for our families today. This is, these scriptures are speaking of what as a shepherd in the home, as a pastor in the home, as a father in the home. This is, my, this is my image. A place of home. A place called home. Brother Brandman, question and answers part four. We'll amplify this more in the future. Make your home nice. Make your home a place where your daughter or son will not be ashamed to bring their company before their father and mother and into their house. Make home so happy that they'll be pleased in their home to stay there. This is what home ought to be. We say a place called home. I was going to take time today to expound upon how there's a difference between a house and a home. A vast difference between a house and a home. This can just be a house. It can just be a gathering place where people come, they hear a word preached, and they just leave. And they feel no connection. They feel no benefit. They're not getting all the things they ought to. And people can treat this as a house, but you won't get the benefits until it's made a home and you treat it like a home. And so this is what we ought to aspire to have in our homes as, as parents. Make your home a nice place, a happy place. And that's what this church ought to be for believers today, a place called home. Brother Bram says in the message, uncertain sound, but in the church house, he's talking about how he preached a meeting in five nights in some, uh, in some sort of convention or arena. He says he likes to be in a church, but in the church house, I believe the angels of God encamp around because of saints gathering there. It's a noted place for God where he comes and meets with his people. That's what this is. That's what the sanctuary is. That's what we're doing on Sundays. And, and I want our children to hear this, that when we say we're going to church, we're not just coming to church to see Brother Lucas. We're coming to church because this is where God meets us. Amen. We're coming to church because he meets us here. He says it's a place where he comes and meets with his people. It's always seemed kindly good to me to be in church. I like it better. And so I'm in a church place and, and instead of an arena. So you can be a, and he says, it seems like at home. I know it's just a fragment, but I wonder if he was going to say family. It seems like at home, you know, it's where we just fellowship together and have things in common. That's what church ought to be. Church ought to have the feelings of home, the sentiments of home. The restoration of the bride tree. Brother Bram's praying before he preaches a message on the bride tree, the restoration of the bride tree. He says, bless this little church. Help me, Lord, as I go to bring the message to other people. And may we together, like one person, one family, stick together and pray together and live together in holy unity of the Holy Spirit until Jesus receives us into his kingdom. For we ask it in his name and for his glory. Amen. That's what church ought to be, a place where we together, like one person and one family, stick together, pray together, live together in holy unity of the Holy Spirit. That's what church ought to be. Just as these believers were scattered throughout all the 
uh, all over that region and that area. They were not just left alone. There was a place where God planted a church. There was a place where God ordained elders. There was a place that they could gather with those other precious saints and have things in common and lift up the word of God and lift up a common ambition. Read the letters of Paul together. Hear the word of God preached. It was a place that God provided for them. And I believe that today there must be a place on earth that can promote the highest of heaven. There must be a place where Christ is lifted up. There's uh, many different quotes, and if you're familiar with, uh, with them, then you could just say, you could say, amen, when I strike that chord, but home life is broken. Home life is in, uh, 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 uncertain. The security of the home is broken. If I put it, my, the words I'm using now, the, the, the family tree has been cut down. It's been completely torn apart to where we all live such separate lives, even to where it's striking. And don't amen too loud because then you might think you're talking about the neighbors in the apartment next door. But there's families, believing families that come to church, husbands and wives that live completely separate lives than with each other because this one does their thing, this one does their thing. And it's just like they convene at night when they go to bed. But in the morning, they're going right back apart again. And then the children themselves, they are broken up. They do this, they do that, they do this, they do that. There's no family time together. There's no family meal time. There's no family unity. There's no family involvement. Everyone has their own little things that they're doing. And you don't even have to go into another room to do it. You can all just sit at the same table and do it now. Because everybody has a screen. And it, it's uh, the, the whole concept of family time, family togetherness. It's been rejected. The world doesn't value it like it once did. And this is in the image of the fall. And, and you know, I, I'm realizing now I may have bit off a little bit more than I could chew. And I, I don't know. The, okay, well, you can stay. Um, but I'm just starting to, I'm starting to wonder just where we're at as far as time. Because I, I really, really want to um, emphasize something here. Because there's in, in the, something in the image of the fall. That, that, that is, is climaxing in the day that, time that we're living in now. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, after Cain is uh, punished, it says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Isn't that remarkable? Or you say the presence of the Lord was in this a particular place. It was towards the presence of the Lord. There was something very special about this area that they were in, even though there were seraphims guarding the way that you couldn't get to the tree of life, that it still denoted something about God, something to keep God in your conscience. And so when he went out from the presence of the Lord, God speaking to him and he leaves him. I, I, and, and I realize now in cutting some of the things out that I did last night, we know that the presence of God is declared by the voice of God. And, and so it was... Where the, voice, where the voice of God is lifted up, that's where his presence is declared. So he's fleeing from that. And it says he dwelt in the land of Nod. This is just aimless. No ambition on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bare Enoch. And now notice this contrast. And he builded a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Now, think of how vastly different this is of Abraham, who after his son is born, he planted a grove and called on the name of the Lord. But now Cain has a son and immediately he builds a city, not planting a grove, but he builds a city and he calls the name of the city after his son Enoch. And a city was a place at the time. You didn't need a city. There's no reason to have a city. There was no need, need to have civilization and all these other things. But a city was a place that was guarded by watch. You put up walls. You built things strategically so you could be on watch. And he built it because of fear. He built it because of terror. And you know what struck me? And I, I've never quite looked at it this way. Cain built a city to protect himself from people like himself. The only reason why, you need, the only reason why Cain needed to build a city is in case there was other Cains out there. You didn't have to worry about Adam. You didn't have to worry about his mom. You didn't have to worry about all these other... It was Cain had to protect himself from Cain. 
But through his fear and his paranoia, civilization, he began to read what the, the artificers and the workings and what they began to do and musical instruments, all these things. This is Cain's idea, civilization, protection, entertainment. All these, he begins to build it to where it climaxes in Genesis 6, 11, 12. The earth also was corrupted before God and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt and all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. All, all begins with Cain being ushered out having a son Enoch, and then he's afraid of all these other uh, siblings and all this other family in the world. And he says, we better build a city. And he builds a city. He doesn't call upon the name of the Lord. He doesn't begin to honor God. What does he do? He calls it, names it after his son. Right. It's a legacy to man. It's a legacy to himself. It's all born out of amb ambition and fear. Yeah. He needed to protect himself. And then we see the conclusion of that kind of thought process and the intermingling where the whole earth is corrupt. The earth is filled with violence and all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth except for one man, Noah. And that's exactly the condition of the world today. The climax of Satan's seeds that he was sowing in Genesis 4. As the Bible says in Luke chapter 17 verses 26 to 32. It says, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank. Now, again, I, I like to point out, and this has been done a Brazilian times, let's just do it one more time. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage. Well, let's just try to pick that apart and figure out what's wrong with that. But it's, it's what's denoted in the days of Noah. Until the day that Noah entered in the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. We're right back again in the days of Noah. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, it's interesting he points out the days of Lot, both times of judgment. But in this case, he leaves out Abraham, but he's bringing us to that time because there's a mystery contained in here. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. I don't know if anybody built today or planted today, but maybe some of us have eaten or drank something. Maybe you've bought, maybe you've sold, thanks to Craigslist or eBay. But in the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Think of how God Christ is choosing to characterize the daily activities of man in this time of judgment. And here, verse 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So what's going to happen when the Son of Man is revealed? People are going to be eating, drinking, sleeping, waking, working, planting, buying, building, selling, doing all sorts of stuff, marrying. All that's going to take place. Just people living, and, uh, living aimlessly like Cain was, building civilizations, doing what would happen in Genesis chapter 6. All these things are going to be happening, but then God is going to reveal himself. So he said, as it was in the days of Lot. So then we have the image of Sodom in the days of Lot, but there's another type to that. There's another scene where it says, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And in prophesying, and, and the, the nearness of this I think is very important, prophesying of the days of of the siege of Jerusalem, it says, In that day he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. Take what? The stuff in the house. He that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. He is now brought up in that prophecy. He's raised something about the working, the planting, the building, the selling, the marrying, and all those things that becomes the distraction. He says, Remember Lot's wife. Because when she left Sodom, there was something that remained there that kept her heart, that kept her attention. And all these labors of planting, building, drinking, buying, selling, there's something that was missing. There's something about what they're doing in these days that's connected to the heart of Cain, who went out from the presence of the Lord and built a city not to honor God, not as a place to worship God, but a place to honor himself and to preserve his legacy after him. So Christ says, in that day, if you're on the housetop, don't go down and his, I like I was just and his stuff. That's what this all that's what that's all we have is just stuff. In our houses, what is it you have? That that really, really nice, expensive comforter you bought. It's just stuff. Our, our whole house is just one big junk drawer. At least my garage is. It's just stuff. And I challenge you this week to get rid of a hundred items and you'll find just how much you love stuff. Why would he say this? It's not the stuff, the possessions in the house we ought to be concerned with. 
He that is in the field in his labor, all worried about his job. What are you worried about your job for? Is that more important? Is that what has the preeminence? Is that what drives you? Is that what motivates you? It's not those things we ought to be concerned about. Christ is bringing this up and these things of planting, buying, building, selling, all these things. And then he uses this image in the day that the Son of Man is revealed. And then he kind of inserts this prophecy of the siege of Titus. And then he brings it right back, remembers Lot's wife. He's wanting us to consider what motivates us, what drives us, what has the preeminence, what has greater value. Does the promise or does the pleasure? Does his presence or is it your position? Our purpose is greater than possessions. Amen. Brother Bram says in flashing red light of the signs of his coming, he says the red lights are flashing and the time is at hand. As it was in the days of Noah, see, they took the legitimate thing and perverted it. They took eating and they took drinking. They put building and they put all these other things and perverted it. So there's a perversion. They've perverted. It wasn't just the act of eating. Well, that's all fast. It wasn't just the act of drinking. Let's all die of dehydration. No. It's in the perverting of it. And I love how he says this. Jesus expects us to build a home. He expects us to build a home. And remember, as men, we're home builders. As sisters, you're homemakers. We have a responsibility not to literally go out and buy a plot of land and build a house, but to whatever, where we live, where we reside, to turn that dwelling into a home, to make this church, which is a gathering place, make it a home. We, Jesus expects us to build, but just look what has taken place in that. Look at what church has become today, Christianity today. Christianity is a meme to the world. They laugh at it. They, tr they, they troll the Christians of today. He says, eating, he expects us to eat. That's right. Look, well, look what's taking place in that. And he goes on, continues on with the drinking. That there's things that we have to do. There's things of necessity. But look how it gets perverted. So he finishes that chapter, Luke 17, verse 37. As he's saying, there's going to be, going to be those taken. And they're like, where, where, where? Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Not gathered around stuff. Not gathered around jobs. Not gathered around eating, planting, buying, selling. Not gathered around all those things, but gathered around the word. Because that's where eagles gather. It's prophesied that there is a gathering place for his elect. There's a place of provision. There's a place of rest. There's a place of shelter. That's what's the image in Jeremiah 23. In the flock that was once scattered is then going to be all brought scattered. It's amazing when you look at sheep that if sheep, they're such a remarkable animal that it's, it's necessary that they have someone that could uh, shorn them and shave them or that can get to a point to where their wool grows so much it can lead to their death. They can't see. They can't eat. They, it'll actually kill them unless they have someone looking out over them and watching over them. So these ones that are scattered, they're not supposed to be on their own. They're not supposed to be out here. They're not supposed to be out there. He says, I'm going to bring them to folds, places of habitation where they can dwell safely. They can dwell peaceably and they can receive justice. What is that? Know who, their value and know their worth. Amen. So many times we take justice in the sense of legalism. Your skirts are too short. Your heels are too high. All of you are making us look bad in the way that you live and the way that you dress. No, justice is letting the people see who they really are. Amen. That's what justice is. It's not a measuring stick or a clothesline or beating people up. It's to, justice is to tr treat them as they ought to be treated and to show them who they are in the Word of God. A gathering place for the elect, rest, and shelter. So just as Cain in Genesis chapter 4 went out from the presence of the Lord, running away from God, running away from the voice of God, and build as a son and builds a city. And names the city after his son. It's like, I don't want to have anything to do with the presence of God. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 25 and 26, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said, She hath appointed me. For God said she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also, there was born a son. So now remember the image of Abraham first, but now Cain, the contrast. And now look again what's in Seth. He has a son named born and he names him Enos. 
Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Such a difference. And that's what we see in Genesis chapter 21. The birth of a son and invoking the name of Jehovah and the everlasting God, the eternal God. Then begin men. Men here are the sons of Adam. And the Bible says, then men begin to call upon the name of the Lord. It means the sons of God sought God together. And as I pondered this last week, I, 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 I thought, how, how did this happen? Was it just instinct? Was it just innate in them? It was just something that, you know, Seth has a son and then Enos comes out and he just wants to serve God. But when you look at the family, you would see that Adam had instilled in his son, Seth, and likewise, it wanted to be expressed even to Enos a sense of the divine, a sense of his presence. That it is not said of Adam, it is not said of Seth, it is not said of his seed, that they fled from the presence of the Lord. It was a place where Adam wanted to keep the voice of God fresh, the remembrance of God fresh, the promise, though, how, no matter how much his channels had been clogged, something in Adam wanted to keep the testimony alive of what God had, the promise that God had made. And so they invoked the name of God together. And when the Bible says they called, they called upon the name of the Lord, in one translation, I think even to the Hebrew, it says they called, they were called by the name of the Lord. In other words, they called themselves by the name of the Lord. They called themselves the sons of God. Amen. And that's why you find later when the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Because in this moment, there's a contrast, there's a distinction. Cain is run off into his folly. The way of Cain has a son, builds a city, names it after his son. But now, by teaching, now by inspiration, now by conviction, now even after, after the similitude of their brother Abel, after the image of Adam, Seth has a son. And they begin not just to call upon the name of the Lord, but they identify themselves not as sons of men, but as sons of God. And that is what we begin to declare to for ourselves. We are not just men and women, but we are sons and daughters of God. And Adam, instilling this in his family, and his family beginning to reflect this. I saw a topic for a minister's meeting back east. The topic is, I don't know if you got it, uh, Brother Reggie, but it's, uh, was Abel born righteous? So I text one of the brothers out there and said, now it's getting fun. <laughs> and it, what happens in Genesis chapter 21, it says, Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba. You're like, Brother Aaron, you're still reading it? We've all memorized it. Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. I'm closing. And I want you to ponder this very deeply. To realize that this one scripture is so inspiring. We've only looked at it for these last two services, but it inspired the first two. And you look at this. Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba. There was so much that led to this moment that's built into this action. And there's so much that it foreshadowed. He planted a tree, planted a grove, a garden. Remember all these things that we've expressed. But it was a place, as I mentioned earlier, that he could testify of what God had done for him. There he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. It's just exactly what Seth and Enos did in the lineage of Adam. They called themselves the sons of God. Abraham would call himself the son of God, a servant of the Most High. It was a place that Abraham testified of the son of man who visited him. And the God who gave him a promise. And the God who had most recently fulfilled it. Is that right in Genesis 21? And where was it? Now, I'm, just, I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 18. And then I have um, three more quotes in a scripture. I'm not going to tell you how long they are. But after this, Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. And follow this with me. Because this is part of the inspiration to his grove. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 8, And the Lord appeared unto Abram, appeared unto him in the plains 
of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. You can all relate to that. In the tent door, imagine this tent would have been built in a place that would have provided some shade, probably north-facing. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. When he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. So he's left as he sees them coming and traveling. He leaves this place where he's abiding. He leaves this place where he was just standing, and he runs to them. And by revelation, he doesn't just acknowledge the three, but he acknowledges the one. He says, my Lord, if now I have found faith in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. He is calling him Lord. He is acknowledging that this is God. This is not, this is some, this is the image of God. This is a, one in the person of God. He reverences him. Lord, if I found favor, pass not from thy servant. And watch what his instinct is. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Wanted to wash their feet, set them under the tree. He says, and I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that, ye shall pass on. What a beautiful image. And, and, and I, I like to, I was looking at this in the continuity of Abraham's life. After he had returned from the battle, who was it? Melchizedek that meets him and serves them. Bread and wine. And Abraham's revelation is growing and service is growing and, and, and his ministry is growing. He's learning how to serve and he, he gets this example. So now he's able to return what he has received in the bread and the wine and the nourishment and the ministry after the battle in Genesis 14. Now he says, Lord, let me fetch some water to wash your feet. Rest under the tree and I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that, ye shall pass on. For therefore ye come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. So they, he met him and he says, come under the tree. Where was the tree? It was where that tent was, by the tent door. They could gather under that tree. It was going to be a place where he washed their feet, fed them bread. And Abraham hastened to the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran into the herd and, and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man, five stars. And he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree. And they did eat. What a beautiful scene. These men coming upon him in the heat of the day. It must have been a hot day. And he comes and his instinct is to minister to them. Let me wash your feet. Let me get you some bread. Let me get you some water. Let me get you some milk. Let me get you some a calf. Let's, let's take bread and butter and let's eat and dress it. And you sit here under the tree and rest. And he stood there with them under the tree, a resting place, a place of feeding, a place where his home was, right there under that shade tree. And Brother Branham in the modern events made clear by prophecy. I found dozens of places where Brother Branham just brought this the tree, the tree under the tree in this instance of the revealing of the Son of Man. He said, one day under the shade tree, while they were sitting and resting, God came down in the form of a man. And to catch the full picture, and I believe I just like how this summarizes it so it can help us to close here. In the message, this day, this scripture is fulfilled. Now, Abraham did not go down in Sodom, he and his group. He had a big group with them, enough to fight off a dozen kings and their army. So he had a big group with them. And he was sitting out there under an oak tree one day. When everything was going wrong for him, nobody had anything to do with him, but he was still holding on to that promise. There was a place where he sat with his group, his family, under that tree. Despised, rejected, persecuted, maybe not fitting in with the crowd like Lot was, but he says, watch now closely before we close. While he was sitting there, down come three men walking to him, Two of them went down into Sodom and preached the gospel to them to come out to Lot. But one stayed with Abraham. Notice, and he's expanding the story beyond where they went down and the Lord remained with them under that tree to reveal himself and further unfold the revelation and promise to him under that tree. He says, notice one that stayed with Abraham was God himself. 
Where did he come to? He came to that home. He came to that place. And it was there under that shade tree where God spoke to him and confirmed the promise and said, I will return unto you according to the time of life and Sarah shall have a son. It was in that place under that tree that God spoke to him and confirmed the promise. And so once God fulfilled that promise in Genesis chapter 21, this is what Abraham's tree represents in verse 33. This is what it represents. It's in the image of the place that God met him in the door, the tent door underneath that tree. It's the place where God met him. And it was a place of service and feet washing and feeding. And I say, may this church be a tree. Where God can come to it. May this church be a tree where God could come and reveal himself to Abraham's seed. In the contrast to what was going on in Sodom. May this be a place that's not characterized by eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building. May it not be a place that's just busy with the things of life. Busy with carnal things. Busy with carnal pursuits. Busy with just opportunities. I think I mentioned it the other day, and it's really the sad reality. I think some people just look at it as a church as an opportunity to pull off another MLM, right? Just more people to practice their wares on and sell things to and get things out of the people. And that's not what family is for. That's not what the church is for. It's not just a place for us to find, find people who can do our bidding. It's not just a place where we say, oh, I'm glad we got a church. I need to move. No, those are all the things that how a family functions in its, in its growth and its development. It's not just a place for eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building as things are in the world. But it's a place where the voice of God is stronger than the voice of politics. It's a place where the voice of God is stronger than the voice of Hollywood. It's a place where the voice of God is speaking. Therefore, it's a place where we come not running from the presence of the Lord, but a place where the presence of God is guaranteed. Brother, I said it's noted for God. It's a place where the Son of Man is being revealed. A place to feed on His unfailing word. Musicians, please come. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, Paul's speaking about us. He says, He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's it. That's what we're doing now. Raised us up together. Made us sit together. Where Abraham was that day, under that tree, he had a view of the well-watered plains of Sodom. He had a view of where those angels were going down. But he had this place, just a little bit higher, a little bit off apart with God himself. He's raised us, to sit to, raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The sermon, I am the resurrection and the life. I said, I, that's what this church ought to be. Now I want to close with this. This quote will be, this is the sermon for Wednesday night. He said, there's righteous people walking in the light of the Lord. He's talking about the, the, the family, the Simeon, and the, the, those that he was revealing himself to. He says, that's the kind of home God can get into. Righteous people walking in the light. That's the kind of home that God can get into. Now, if you're serving all kinds of parties and beer and everything in your house, God will never visit you there. That's right. But if you've got a home that's cleaned up and living for God with prayer and the Bible open and a few tear stains on it, God can visit you. That's right. Because you've opened up a channel that he can come to. That's the word of God. You can open up a channel. How? By making it a place that God can come to. Imagine that Abraham planted a grove and oft looked to the horizon for another visitation of Elohim. Had it, had a place there before the well watered plains of Sodom. In the heat of the day, just sitting there, as Brother Branham said, nobody will have anything to do with me. Everything's going wrong. But he's sitting there saying, but I know who holds tomorrow. I know the promise he made, Sarah. 
God made the promise. Wrestling with things, pondering things. But that day under that tree, he looked up and the Lord was coming. And there under that tree, in the heat of the day, bread was served, feet were washed, meat was eaten. And God spoke to him and confirmed his promise. And I could just see Abraham, after this son is born, he planted a tamarisk tree. And he planted a grove and he, he had a place reserved there. And it was a reminder, it was a reminder of that place where God met him. And it was in that place he could testify of the one who came and spoke to him. Of the one who came and prophesied to him. That's what this church is. It's a well, it's an oasis. It's a place you can call home. That's what your houses need to be. The place that can be called home. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, in our hearts, we see so much truth. We hear so much word. And there's a longing to live it. There's an image in the scripture that seems historical, that seems allegorical, that seems in shadows and types. And Lord, as I preach it, I realize to some it may seem to be pointing backwards, but Lord, may there be a quickening right now that it just comes into focus for present day. Just in this moment, Lord, there can be husbands that recognize a pathway to make this applicable. Wives who can see avenues to support that vision to not try to be the leader, to not be the one that's pushing or the one that's pulling, but just a way that they could support, hold up their end of the labor. And Lord, where there's homes that are broken or where there's maybe a difference of standard, may you, Lord, visit that home. Lord, today, visit this family as we've gathered in this place. This is a place where the atmosphere can be right and it's a noted place for God and we gather as a family, and there may be disharmony and disunity in our houses and our residences beyond these walls. But if we can make this place a home, then it can be a spot where you come and they feed. Their feet are washed. They're nourished by the butter and the milk and the bread and the calf. And it gives them courage to go home and do things right. Pray, Lord, that you strengthen your families today. Lord, you know, in my own home, there's such a uh, uh, preciousness with my children such a, a beautiful vision that I share with my wife there's challenges Lord and I know challenges are opportunities for victory challenges are opportunities to stay, take steps higher but there's moments that break our hearts Lord there's moments where we we trust you. We can only trust you, Lord, for the outcome. But I do not want to take my hands off, Lord, from working, from laboring, from serving, from sanctifying. I could turn that house into a home. Lord, with the way things are in economics and the future days unfold from weeks into years and decades, it could be a time when not many would be able to own their own house. But Lord, wherever we are, may we make it a home. This church now, just renting, Lord, but we don't want to just look down on this facility, Lord. We want to make it a home. Make it a place where you can come to. So I pray that you bless us today. Thank you for your presence amongst us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray.